Hello, my name is Pratik Jaktav. I am a research assistant professor at the University of Minnesota, a part of the Galaxy P team, um, wherein we develop proteomics tools uh, to be deployed within Galaxy. Uh, the team at University of Minnesota, led by uh, Professor Tim Griffin, basically works on um, adding uh, tools and workflows for proteogenomics research as well as metaproteomics research. And we have been doing this for the last six years. Uh, we conduct tutorials um, as well as we have started using these workflows for multiple research projects. Uh, and I'm very excited to be part of this cancer proteogenomics uh, workshop uh, here in Mumbai. Um, basically because of the fact that that's the research uh, that we work on and gives us an ability to reach out to uh, the audience here in, in India as well as uh, uh, the rest of the world. Right, so I'll try to answer this question in two parts. The first part that you mentioned was about a common platform. And that's exactly what we do with uh, the Galaxy platform. And I'll be giving a talk very soon about that. But uh, Galaxy platform basically helps uh, both genomics, transcriptomics, as well as proteomics researchers to use a common tool or platform to use it. But in general, I mean, one of the, the main barriers that I see is, um, uh, the, you know, most of the times researchers or developers uh, are kind of specialized in one field and not the rest of them. And hope, hopefully a platform like Galaxy or anything else uh, helps to, to bring that common playground or a common place wherein all these uh, researchers or developers can develop tools and help integrate the data. Um, I think there is also a need uh, for researchers to understand um, the fact that developers and users need to work together because uh, things that are developed by a developer might or might not be useful to a user. So it could be a great algorithm, does fantastic things, but if it is not something that uh, aligns with the question that is asked by the researcher, then it just becomes an academic tool, right? Uh, vice versa, the user also has to understand the possibilities and uh, challenges that a developer faces um, and, and, and try to achieve uh, tools that work and give you a multi-omic uh, or a systems biology perspective to the data. One of the uh, observations that researchers have started making now with multiomics or transomics research, as it's called, uh, when, when we're comparing, let's say, uh, transcriptomic data to proteomic data, at least in early days, one found that the, the, cors the correspondence to each other in terms of quantitative uh, expression was not exactly 100%. In fact, the concurrence was much, much lower. And that was a little bit of a concern earlier, but now it is understood that the way RNA expression works or protein expression works is not exactly instantaneous in the sense you could have a RNA expression and the protein expression could lag behind, right? Or you could have uh, the stability of your RNA molecule determining, um, you know, how much of protein is going to be expressed. So I think <clears throat> it is really important uh, that researchers start undertaking temporal or time-dependent expression studies for both transcriptomics and proteomics um, to kind of make a much more um, uh, much more studied uh, conclusion on the expression of both protein as well as RNA. Because if you find that the RNA is low in protein is more, it doesn't mean that you know you know it, it's just giving you a, a particular snapshot and not uh, the, the the cycle of that particular uh, expression. So. I guess the answer to that is time-dependent uh, studies and the technology is getting there. I mean, RNA-seq is already there and I think with newer um, uh, developments in mass spectrometry, the scan speeds are, um, are getting really fast. Uh, we hope that uh, we can get deeper as well as a uh, lot more data from mass spectrometry data so that one can match that with transcriptomic data. I have a little bit of concern with that, given that, um, you know, uh, and again, I've, uh, personally, I've, I haven't really studied that as much. I've worked on domains and I've looked at um, using domains, how one can predict the function of a protein. 
but in terms of interaction i uh, either one uh, do not have enough information or secondly um, if you have predictive models um, and if these predictive models are backed up by experimental data um, then yes one can say that but until we actually have a good um, correlation between those two uh, i think experimental data is going to be a uh, lot more dependent or a lot more determinant of what actually interacts with each other rather than um, uh, you know computational modeling but that's my my opinion i think it's important to start with rna seq data and i'll be covering a little bit of that in our uh, in the in the talk that i'm giving today um so if you start with the rna seq data uh, obviously you have your genomic coordinates or you can go it back to your genomic coordinates and if you use that as a template and transfer that information to your proteomics data or at least have um database schema to kind of um go back and find out your genomic coordinates or gene centric approach to that i think that's uh, that's possible we have shown that and um obviously there are tools and workflows that need to be first developed and then optimized and make made robust enough so that one can do this on a more consistent basis not only for known organisms for but also for organisms that are you know getting getting sequenced uh, but it definitely is possible uh, going through the rna seq data um i think <clears throat> for the proteomics field to uh, develop one would actually have to make this uh, almost a requirement um because if you do not correlate your protein to your uh, dna or to your rna you are most losing that information um and you want to maintain that because you kind of know it's coming from you know from dna to rna to protein uh just the fact that if you don't have the tools available or the coordinates available um is not a good enough excuse to uh, to lose that information so uh, i think it's going to be necessary as the field of proteomics becomes a more established field as you know as it's emerging so i have basically worked on two uh, workflows or two areas of research one is proteomics so when we started working on galaxy uh or using galaxy for proteomics what we did not want to do was um just develop another uh, platform for proteomics research you know take in your mass spec data you protein fasta file you get peptides and proteins there are many tools which do that what we wanted to do was take some challenging areas and this was 6 years ago so proteomics was very new meta proteomics was very new uh and uh, or i wouldn't say they were very new but they were emerging and we saw a, a promise as well as a challenge there um so what we did there was we uh, we worked with the post processing of the peptides identified and trying to make it easier for a user to use it um and that's where um, uh, i mean the challenge there is working with a user or a project and a developer and as i was mentioning during the break um you know a developer is extremely uh, you know enthusiastic about his work uh, the user is very focused on his questions asked and sometimes these do not meet and that leads to um a program or a workflow which you know which which is great in its own field but it's not usable right so i think the developers and users have to work together on a project with a specific questions in mind and then creativity starts coming and once you have the basic blocks in place i think that's how um you know uh, tools are going to develop in terms of its current status i think it's in pretty good shape i would say mzml format mz identifiable format are kind of getting accepted the only part i think um, i see a need for development is the mz quant or uh, the the quantitation uh, portion of the the mzml uh, uh, format and i know there are there are uh, developments taking their place there but i think uh, making this more robust and uh, optimized uh, is going to be the need because there i think are going to be many um, many quantitative studies and especially quantitative studies that correlate to rna seq data uh, or any other quantitative analysis data so um, getting the quantitative uh, portion 
of uh, the proteomics or mass spectrometry data is going to be important. I'll again answer this in two parts. One is, you know, you want to develop something to show it works, right? And we have been doing that. We, we take small data sets, generate workflows, develop it on a cloud, you know, build a Docker instance, share it with the world. We, we give presentations saying this works. Um, but <clears throat> that's almost like playing a, a sport in a small little, you know, backyard or something. Um, the real data that comes out is not going to be just few raw files or a few fast queue files, but it's going to be many and maybe multiple replicates and hopefully many time points as well. So you need to have something at the uh, at the back end. The, the, the infrastructure needs to be such that it can support that. But it's also important that the tools and the workflows can run on that. They use the ability to use uh, you know the vast resources that are available either in the cloud like uh, Amazon and, uh, and Google um, or you know any any supercomputing infrastructure that you might have. So I think it would need to go through steps. Uh, you need to make it work first, and then you know just like uh, a child develops, you want to see that it graduates from that uh, you know it, it's 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 cool to to college and maybe um, into into the real world. So um, there is definitely need for that. In academic settings, sometimes it's not possible because teams get funded for five years and then. Uh, focus changes, but I hope the field in general uh, kind of understands that and and makes it possible because it's really not much fun to go back, develop a new workflow, and start again and again. So uh, hopefully there is uh, you know this this momentum keeps going on. At multiple levels, um, definitely the ability to ask good questions. And that doesn't come easily, right? I mean, some people are naturally talented. They'll ask good questions after, you know, uh, after, uh, after uh, in really early in their education. But one thing that you develop as you do your advanced studies is you start asking really good, sharp questions. I mean, um, as a young student, you always have 10 questions, but you're not, you're not able to decide which of these 10 are good. You think all 10 of these are good, right? So asking good questions. And then, um, secondly, designing experiments. Uh, it's always good to have great ideas, but to put it into a practical, stepwise manner is important. Uh, the third part is, you know, sample preparation. I mean, uh, I know. I mean, I work in the bioinformatics area, and I know that many researchers kind of, kind of are, take it as sample preparation is going to be good, or you you either blame the sample preparation, or you you know you kind of. Uh, kind of taking taking it for granted, but I think there is a lot of quality control that needs to be done. A uh, lot of um, lot of things that need to be you know uh, considered, and that's true for data acquisition as well. You need to have QC parameters to ensure that if you have replicate um, you know generated on day one and generated on day ten, you can compare them. Or if you cannot compare them, what is the uh, what is the reason you cannot? You know, so the measures to have that, and there are tools in place to do that as well. But I think most importantly, it's, it's important that the researcher um, gets to interpret the data, right? And interpretation could be on various levels. It could be by using programming, you, or it could be just a biological interpretation wherein saying, good, I've seen this data, I know what it means, but I need tools to do that. And that's where the person can work with the developer, which is what I do. I work with developers because I kind of get a sense of where the data is going or what could be important. But you know, um, you can start in one area and then develop into any other area, or you could just become an expert in one area, and then you know, once you start having that ability to look at an uh, overview of the project, asking good questions, and publishing good science, uh, then I think you you you've achieved the ability to do you know uh, things. Um, while I was answering, one of the things I kind of learned during uh, during my career was also ability to communicate. And this is not just through manuscripts and through, um, you know, through anything that's public or, I think you need to clearly mention to the person you're collaborating with because team science is going to be very important now. You cannot be an expert in mass spec and an expert in, and you might be, but you might not have time to do that. So you need to communicate your expectations 
to your you know collaborator and get the best out of them and also offer the best that they want from you so i think communication is very important i, I think obviously the younger generation already has a, a, a kind of a strength in that because of the amount of social media that's available but i think it's 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 important to have effective communication while avoiding the noise you know how do i get this across to somebody which is a signal that could be useful rather than giving you 10 pages of data and say go find your answer so i think these are a few things that 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 develop uh, and i'm sure there will be new skill sets that will come up as as the uh, you know as the field develops Hi, uh, my name is Ratnarajesh Tangadu. Uh, I am from a company called ESAC. Uh, we work closely with the National Institutes of Health, USA. So we are a bioinformatics and health IT company. Uh, we do provide a lot of services to both the National Institutes of Health and also the Office of National Coordinator uh, in the USA. I think uh, we can start with the sheer volume of the data. And then uh, there is lack of resources and also the infrastructure to manage that volume. So everyone has all their kind of tools and the processes and pipelines, but not to handle the big volume of data. And the other thing I would stress is the lack of uh, data standards or the lack of adherence to it. So what happens is you have a large amount of data, but there is no data standard. So you can actually come, you don't, you, you miss the ability to actually combine that analysis with other data sets that are pre-existing or that are coming from the other programs. So uh, I think these are the main three things that, that that strikes my mind to begin with. Data standards are basically a set of rules. Uh, are agreed upon rules so that you represent your data in a certain way, so annotate that and also represent it. So uh, that actually helps the data harmonization part. So what happens when you start generating data which is specific to a particular program or a particular country or a particular disease type or particular population and when you want to actually integrate the data into a bigger platform and bring the data from other platforms, for example, you, you call the same disease or the same gene by different names. And you know that it's the same, but the computer doesn't understand until you tell that. So data standards actually help you uh, get to that point. And the other point is in the, in, in the data harmonization, so you, you analyze all of the data through a particular pipeline, so that allows you to see all the data through the same eyes. So uh, even though you can analyze each of those data set independently uh, with a different pipeline, uh, harmonization actually brings them together and helps understanding on a larger scale. Earlier I mentioned about uh, the lack of infrastructure or the lack of resources. So uh, cloud computing actually uh, removes that barrier. So it's, it's on demand, pretty elastic. So there are a lot of companies out there uh, which are pretty established, something like Amazon, Google Cloud, and now Microsoft Azure is there. So for that, you don't need to have a data center on your premises. So you don't need to have a a uh, set of IT crew helping you out, uh, adding more disk space and networking and all these things. So what you need is basically a good internet connection. Um, so you, based on the volume of the data, it will scale up pretty quickly. So you can increase the uh, size of the disk space that you are using and also kind of resources, so the compute power that you need. So it's, it's pretty uh, helpful in that sense. So in the precision medicine, so the question is specific to that. So what happens is like, it's not the data about a particular program, but it's data about the individual patient or, or individual candidate or a subject. It depends on how you call that. So uh, within the personalized genomic space, so every day uh, the data is growing exponentially. So the Moore's law, it doesn't apply anymore. Uh, so cloud computing comes into picture to handle that kind of data. Uh, I don't see it as a, such a big problem because the connections between the genes and the proteins in the level, at the level of action numbers between 
The most common data uh, databases out there are, for example, RefSeq and Unipro. They are very well annotated and they are very well maintained. And most of the proteomic pipelines are actually rolling up the final protein parsimony results to the gene level. So it's pretty easy to actually map back to the individual isoforms. And also, if you start from isoform, you can easily come back to the genes. So now uh, the big buzzword everywhere, at, the, at least at the level of the governments uh, that are involved, the US and the, I would say the European Union, is the big data and the data commons. So data commons actually brings together everything at one place. So uh, the resources in terms of the storage, the tools, the compute power, everything at one place. That's called data commons. So what the user needs is simple login. So like the way you uh, log into your email account, so the user can actually just log in and he doesn't have to bring anything to the table. And the only thing that's there is he can take back some results from the analysis directly from the uh, cloud computing platform. Like I said earlier, data standards, standards, standards. That's very, very important in achieving the goal uh, that we have uh, in front of us. There's the precision medicine, the large volumes of data. And if you, and the, so the siloed nature of the data actually never helps. So you have this genomics, proteomics, Im, uh, imaging, the immunology, all these data are sitting there side by side, but they can't talk to each other because there are no standards there. I'm not, uh, let, let's me, let me take that back. There are standards there, but they're, they're not adhered to. So what happens is you're calling the same thing with different names, like I said earlier, so you cannot actually do the integrated analysis. Keep your eyes wide open because there is a lot of open source data already available. So you do not have to actually generate the data. You can start looking into the existing resources bring the data onto your laptop and start analyzing that. So to analyze, the simplest tools I would recommend uh, currently are R and Python. Uh, so they're pretty easy to learn. Uh, and all the public data that's available there, you could process that data through the, so those kind of parsing tools and the statistical packages and you're ready to go. There are some uh, portals that, that I know of uh, which collate all the data from the literature and also uh, the Nucleic Acid Research is a journal which publishes the available databases and the tools uh, on a yearly basis. But at the same time, uh, now it's a requirement with most journals that you, um, you make your data available somewhere on a public repository and also the tools that, are, that you have used and, and also the versions of the tools. So it actually a lot of things that are already there that provide uh, the metadata of the analysis that's performed on the particular data set. Uh, so the data is available, the tools that are used are available and the versions are available. So it actually helps to reanalyze the data on a different settings or on a different data set or, or just simply reanalyze and to see, cross check the validity of the reports from the publication. That's critical to the, all of the uh, uh, data commons efforts that we talked about, right? So if you do not share the data, so there is, there is no data commons. So if you want to share the data, uh, uh, that's always welcome. And, and now the governments actually require you to, I mean, as long as the research funding is coming from the public money, they are required to submit their data to uh, one of these resources. Uh, for example, in US, there is called something called Genomic Data Commons, where they make available all of the genomic data, and now they're building a proteomic data commons that we are building in our group. Uh, and then the other point is, so it actually helps innovation. So uh, sometimes you start with a, a small data set, for example, the TCGA pan cancer analysis is one such an example. So there are about 30 plus different cancer types that they have been analyzed. And now after so many years, the program closed, I think at least three or four years ago. Uh, but now there is research coming, going into that. And uh, just because the data is shared, everything is available in the public domain and people are using the data. 
So a lot of proteomic data is uh, it's not protected. It's in, the, in other words, it's open access. So that's a good thing. But the, if you are looking at specifically at the proteogenomic kind of integration, so some of the genomic data is actually uh, controlled access. So there are data access committees. Uh, so you need to submit an application. They will review your application. And uh, it, there is no uh, cost factor involved here other than your research interest. So, uh, so once you uh, submit that, uh, so they will review your application and see the research, research statement and they come back to you with their decision. And uh, there is uh, the expectation that you adhere to the guidelines uh, proposed by those kind of repositories. So what happens? This is all patient related data. So patient privacy is uh, primal to the, all of the data sharing. 